On this week's Gadget Show Web TV, John's been taking some cityscape snaps with a Canon EOS 7D. I bring you all the latest tech news, and we bring you the top five worst gadgets of the decade. Welcome to this week's Web TV. Right, to kick things off, John's been out and about with the latest Canon SLR, the EOS 7D. With its 18 megapixels and full 1080p video recording, it looks like an impressive setup. So what better way to test it than taking it high in the sky in the centre of Birmingham? Canon's 10D to 50D series of top enthusiast level digital SLRs have been facing some pretty tough competition in the market lately, especially from Nikon who launched their excellent D300 a couple of years back. But now they're determined to catch up with this, the new EOS 7D. It's especially important because uh, Nikon have recently revised the D300 and turned it into the D300S, which improves on the original in several areas. Now, first glance, they do seem to have made good progress. The moment you look through the viewfinder, you notice it's uh, large and bright, every bit as large and bright as the one on the D300. And like the D300s, it gives you 100% coverage of what you're about to shoot. They've uh, upped the megapixel count to 18 megapixels. That's uh, considerably more than Nikon's 12, though as ever, what you do with them rather than the number counts most. Um, they've also upped the maximum frame rate you can shoot at to nine frames per second. Uh, that's marginally beating the D300's eight in standard trim. It's also got more autofocus points. They've now brought the total to 19, although that's still short of the 51 you get with the D300. They've also uh, taken a lesson, as it were, from the success of Canon's uh, 5D Mark II and uh, given the camera very good video shooting capabilities. You can actually shoot 1080p video. We're going to try that out and the rest of it, though, on this rather splendid wheel in the middle of Birmingham. They're really taking video very seriously on this camera. You now get a dedicated video switch, flick it over there into the video position, and a live view of what you're about to record appears on the screen, and you press start, stop to go in and out of record. Now, you're still, as ever, better off focusing manually because the autofocus is very slow. You can do it by pressing the AF on button, but uh, it interrupts the exposure, and you really don't want to do it in the middle of a shot. And you now get a choice of high definition frame rates, 24 or 25 frames per second. And you can shoot in lower definitions than 1080p if you want to. But overall, it does give really very good videos. Whether they're quite as good as the ones produced by the 5D Mark II, though, I'm not sure, because that, of course, has a full frame sensor. And you do get that almost magical effect of a lack of depth of field, which is so refreshing to see in video. You don't get quite that with this, although this is still very good in low light conditions. Um, not quite as good as the 5D Mark II, but you still can get really impressive video in dust conditions as at the moment. And the stills performance is very good too. It feels a very responsive camera. The 18 megapixels really do give you very sharp images and it's a good camera in low light as well. Nearly as good as the 5D Mark II, in fact. You can actually shoot right up to the maximum ISO setting of 6,400 and even 12,800 on special occasions. And you can still retain detail in the images with good colours and not too much noise. It's got other good features too. The magnesium body feels solid and good to hold. It's got a built-in flash with uh, the equivalent angle of view of a 14mm lens, which is good. And you've got a great spirit level to check the levelness of your horizon. And the actual LCD is of very good quality. It's got a new sort of anti-reflective coating and very strong colours. I still prefer the logic of the Nikon's controls and the fact that you get more information in the D300's viewfinder, but overall the bottom line is that Canon really have caught up with this EOS 7D. They have closed the gap right together and in some ways they're actually beating the D300 in terms of the maximum resolution, in terms of that high speed frame rate and in terms of the camera's movie capabilities. So which one you choose really is down to personal preference and whether you happen to have that whole legacy of Nikon lenses or Canon ones in your collection.
Right, news time now and first up with HD Freeview being recently launched in a selected area of London. It's leaving some people who want to receive the service slightly puzzled as there's currently no set-top box available on the market that can decode the signal. So Humax have stepped in and unveiled their very own Freeview HD set-top box, the Humax HD Fox T2. It's the first to utilise the DVB T2 tuner which is needed to receive the HD signal. With a likely price of around £170, the HD Fox T2 comes with auto retune and also the ability to upscale pictures to 1080p at 50 frames per second. The HD Box will have the same features as its standard DEF predecessors, but unfortunately USB recording will only be allowed for archiving material and not for direct to device recording. Next, it seems that Google having their own operating system on mobile phones isn't enough. As they announced at CES earlier this week, they're going to release their own handset called the Nexus One. It's made by HTC and is set to rival competitors from Nokia, BlackBerry and Apple's hugely successful iPhone. Amongst an array of features, it has a 3.7 inch touchscreen, a 5 megapixel camera with an LED flash, noise cancelling technology built into the handset and voice recognition so you can dictate your emails. And as it runs on the Android platform, there are endless possibilities for new and interesting apps. Reports state that the Nexus One will be available unlocked, so you're not restricted to any particular network, but you'll also be able to get it through Vodafone on a contract at a subsidised rate. The unlocked handset is available in the US for around $520, which equates to around £330, so fingers crossed the price will stay the same when it's released here in the spring. Android handsets already account for over 5% of European phone sales, so the arrival of the Nexus One backed by Google is no surprise. And with their backing, it's sure to have a big impact on the smartphone market. The noughties are well and truly over, so we thought we'd bring you a special top five to celebrate some of the gadgets that we thought were some way off from going on this wall. At five, it's the Gizmondo handheld games console. It was meant to take on Sony's PSP and Nintendo's DS at their own game. And actually, it was a pretty attractive proposition, given that it had an onboard GPS, a media browser, and a camera. Actually, can I rephrase that? Because you should never really use the word pretty in conjunction with the Gizmondo, because after all, it does look a bit like Shrek. When the Gizmondo was launched in 2005, it pretty much sank without a trace, unable to live alongside the gaming superpowers of Nintendo and Sony. And so, there was virtually nothing to play on it. And the Gizmondo's prospects weren't helped by the fact that one of its company executives, Stefan Eriksson, was convicted of fraud. Within less than a year, the company who came up with it had gone bust, owing more than $300 million. And the ogre that was the Gizmondo was no more. At number four, it's the wheel surf. Back in 2006, a Brazilian man called Tito Lucas Ott invented a new form of transport and called it the wheel surf, a bizarre personal transport where the driver sits inside a motorised rotating wheel. It looked incredibly promising, so I flew to the Netherlands to test drive it. And that was when we all learned the awful truth. It was rubbish. It was almost impossible to control and was hugely slow and, well, a bit boring. At number three, it's the Amstrad Emailer. Back in 2000, when email was still a new concept, Amstrad came up with a neat idea. A phone that could send and receive emails. Fantastic idea, brilliant, bound to be a success. It wasn't the most user-friendly of devices. Early emailers were expensive, had a very basic display, an impossibly fiddly keyboard, and were expensive to run. Amstrad's boss, Sir Alan Sugar, was its biggest fan and promoted it endlessly, but it never caught on. I mean, think about it. Back then, if I wanted email, I'd have bought a computer. I'm sorry, Amstrad emailer, you're fired. At number two, it's video calling. Back at the turn of the century, the coolest thing on your mobile phone was probably Snake. But in 2003, all that changed. That was when Britain's first 3G network went live. And 3G not only meant phones with better mobile internet and mobile TV, but the future had arrived and we could now make video phone calls. Look, Granny, it's your new granddaughter. Yes, you could not only talk to your friends, but you could see them oh, too. Oh, no! I'm just reading the paper, there's a great what? story here, look! You've got no clothes! Oh! The fact is that we didn't want to see or need to see who we were calling, especially if for the privilege you had to pay twice as much money, and trust me, that is not a privilege. Put some clothes on, I can see your lunch. And at number one, the worst gadget idea of the last decade, Windows Vista. 
It was launched in a blaze of publicity. But soon after Windows Vista hit the shelves, the internet was awash with horror stories from those who'd been brave enough to take the plunge and upgrade. Oh. PCs were running slower than usual, graphics and sound cards were no longer recognised, popular software no longer worked. Older computers were being annihilated by the operating system that had promised to put the fun back into home computing. Thankfully, we've now got the much better and more solid Windows 7, and soon Vista will be little more than a quaint bit of computing history you sometimes find on old PCs. Well, that's all we've got time for today, but be sure to check out Jason's gaming page for exclusive interviews and reviews, and remember to check out our Facebook and Twitter pages to keep up to date with all the gang here at the Gadget Office. And don't forget, it's only a few short weeks before the main show makes it back to your screens. See you next time.